So you have again sort of a hierarchy, right? I can tell you, I'm I'm not a card carrying immunologist, but the immunologists have the same thing. You know, the T cell is sort of the king, and then then comes the B cell. And if you're a macrophage researcher, I mean, you're so sorry, um, I, I'm a bit facetious here. You know, this kind of rank order thinking is so dominant, and it influences how we perceive reality and then how we construct it as a society. Yeah, and it's also it's also like modifying which are our questions because we know what we need to do to be published and to have. Good morning, everybody. I think I know all of you here today, and that's that's wonderful. So I'm Carmen, and this is the last um, session of Bio Room for this year. So I'm very excited for uh, this uh, last edition, last edition, and well, not last edition, last session of this edition. Um, sorry, still early here. And uh, so Bioroom was started as a seminar series and then we expanded it and we made it more of a career development too and also science communication tools. So we had a lot of exciting um, sessions this year and we hope we can continue next year. So perhaps we can meet again in January or February and then we will decide um, we will meet up again and then we will do another brainstorming. So for all the new people here, like Kira, for example, uh, we usually, we meet in the very beginning, we brainstorm ideas and you're welcome to join us. And then we set up a new schedule for a new edition. So that's what we're going to do next year as well. Um, so without further delay, I will introduce uh, Michael Backman, which is a uh, who's one of the first bio room people that joined us from the very beginning. And I'm very excited because today he's gonna to speak about the social construction of science. So please, Michael, go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Carmen. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful experience with you all. Um, so today I wanna to talk a bit about the social construction of science. So thank you all for coming. This is very experimental. This is um, sort of some thoughts that I have gathered over more than 30 years of being in science. It's been kind of a journey of discovery. And I have to sort of start with a disclaimer right off the bat. I'm not a social scientist. I'm trained as an MD. And MDs know a little bit about lots of stuff. And then as a virologist, and all of this sort of was completely, how shall we say, what I'm talking about, um, very unclear to me, or I didn't even know what I didn't know um, 30 years ago. So let's see how this goes. And another disclaimer, as like any old style professor, I have way too many slides. Um, so we will see how far we get in this uh, journey together. And, um, but I also would encourage you to interrupt me um, if you have questions, so don't feel uh, like you, this is sort of a one-way street here always, uh, I'm downloading everything on you. This should be a dialogue, okay? This is sort of also part of this, this experiment of Biorum. So here's the overview. Um, we'll be sort of briefly discussing what science is and the history of the context of science, meaning the societies that we all live in. And then I'm going to go a little bit into multiple intelligences. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have heard of that. And discuss kind of what aspects of these intelligences are fostered in, in academia and then which ones are not. And then I'm going to talk a bit about my own sort of field of interest, and that's cancer. And in particular, the so-called war on cancer and whether or not that is a social construction and how it is constructed and all the things that play a role. And then finally, if we get to it, that um, we'll see, talk a bit about the Anthropocene and the sixth extinction, sort of the, the time and age that we're living in and what we as scientists can, can do about it uh, um, to make a difference. So uh, here are some guiding principles I have. Um, so don't, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. This is going to be, as I said, experimental. So keep your mind open, but not so open that your brains fall out. And then uh, lastly, 
they were like Marcel Proust said, so the, the idea here is um, in science, you want to acquire new eyes. You want to look at things differently than, than what you uh, started out with. Um, so in this process of transformation. And then part of that has to do with how we actually deal with nature. So it's a long quote from Rachel Carson. I don't want to uh, belabor it too much, but we have to figure out a way how to live in harmony with our planet. And that's going to be the end. Hopefully I'll get to that. And then lastly, as, as Alice Walker here says, part at least for my life has been to be an activist besides being a scientist. Uh, as part of my rent that I pay for living on this planet. So another guiding principle, and I think I, I said that earlier uh, last week to Kira, and that is if you consider all of the publications, for example, on cancer, it's, uh, you know, we're in the millions. Nobody's read them all. So we all operate from incomplete knowledge. Um, and um, that's humbling. But I think it also calls for a different model that we, everybody contributes, right? And we'll talk about sort of models in a little bit. So what is science? It's mostly sort of a, a way of thinking where characterized by the scientific method. So you all practice that day in and day out. You have an observation and then you think about it. You have a hypothesis. You test that hypothesis in an experiment. And then in the experiment, you see certain results. Uh, so, uh, and then you either accept or, or reject that hypothesis. And so over time, you develop concepts and frameworks, and those evolve into entire theories. Now, that's sort of the conventional way of how we look at that science. And uh, one side note is our language is actually influence how we think about the world. And so that may constrain or actually expand the way in how we think scientifically. So in the social construction of science, you have lots of different sort of field forces that influence what we do in science, what we know in science, and how we practice science, and vice versa. It's a two-way street, right? So we have philosophy, psychology influencing it. And we have history, of course, that builds on a lot of uh, past thinking. And then we have economics and politics also influencing that. And as we progress in science, we learn more. And so we add to this field up here uh, in, the, in the left quadrant, we know what we know, right? But, and often if we're lucky, we, we also know what we don't know. But the hard ones are, what we don't know that we know, and then also what we don't know that we don't know. And then to top it all off is what Mark Twain said, what gets us in trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just aims so. So misguided perceptions, assumptions, um, erroneous thinking, etc. So, so let's take a quick look, sort of summarizing, summarizing human sort of evolution as societies on this planet in sort of one slide very quickly. So humans started out of East Africa as hunter-gatherers, and then the next process was to, to develop uh, settlements around agricultural areas. And then from there on, we had the construction of cities. So we had sort of these three stages. Actually, there's one stage in between. That's the pastoralists uh, that are semi-sedentary, uh, right? And so as we see here on the right, the urban population has been increasing tremendously, such that by now, half of the, the world's population also lives in cities, if not more. Now, the question is, does that actually have mental and um, emotional, spiritual consequences? Or is it only that the technology changes and our minds stay the same? Then the other thing is that there is always sort of kind of a hierarchy of power and influence. So people in cities have definitely more influence than hunter-gatherers. And uh, for the longest time, we are also being urbanites down on um, hunter-gatherers. 
right? So there's the, the framing of them as, as primitive or savages. And so there's clear sort of a hierarchy of, of self-perception that the urbanites think of themselves as superior to agriculturists who may think of them superior as pastoralists who may think of themselves as superior to hunter-gatherers. Now, I don't know what the hunter-gatherers are thinking, but um, that may also be reverse. So each group has a particular type of knowledge and it doesn't necessarily overlap. And we'll see that in a minute. So the question is then as societies progress, is there a certain knowledge and mental attitudes and skills that are gained and then are others lost, right? So we think that as we progress into urban societies that sort of everything it gets carried over and maintained, but I'll show you uh, briefly that that's actually not the case. So in, in science, we have sort of this, this idea that um, everything sort of progresses logically and it's almost like by necessity and uh, inevitability that science progresses. We, we get increasingly better and more knowledge. And what we don't learn during our education is all the failures and the mistakes and the debates, right? So most of our textbooks that we give students to study with don't have any debate. There's just sort of a, a, a filtered set of, of knowledge. I call that sort of uh, extracted, purified, sterilized, autoclave knowledge. So it's made safe for consumption for the student. And then the student is sort of asked to, to repeat all of that, right? That uh, model is sort of what we've been doing for, for quite a while. And rare are the exceptions where sort of the, the teaching is, is different. And I, I hope that you all appreciate when you have a teacher that sort of goes into things a little bit differently. Now, another thing is that we are rarely aware of is that when we practice science, there's sort of a a background of how we look at the world. And so one sort of fundamental uh, view that has been carried on for uh, centuries in the Western academia um, that started in the 11th century um, in Italy and England and Germany and France, etc., cetera, um, is that we have sort of this idea of subject object separation, self other, uh, up, uh, uh, separation. This is also, you know, all of these institutions were male dominated, male exclusive actually originally, and it took until the 19th century until that slowly changed, and we're still sort of in a transition to a more uh, balanced model. So, so the the idea is often uh, that we objectify definitely nature. That may transfer over to other people, uh, controlling them, manipulating nature, exploiting nature, and then the ultimate sort of pinnacle of, of that kind of attitude is sort of do war on, on nature and uh, if not on other people too, and use science and technology to build weapons of, of war and, um, you know, in the worst case, mass destruction. So this is kind of a, an implicit sort of subterraneous uh, what, what Carl Jung would, would call sort of the common uh, subconsciousness, sort of uh, a shared uh, view, right? It's not shared by everybody, but there's, there's definitely uh, kind of, um, uh, it, it permeates quite widely this sort of subject, uh, object separation and strict self other kind of distinction. So is this actually necessary? And then what are the consequences of that, right? Um, so here's my sort of first kind of counter to the conventional history of, of um, science. And that is, in fact, uh, Louis Liebenberg is a naturalist and biologist in, in South Africa. And he's been studying with the Kalahari Bushman. And he actually uh, postulates that the first science is not like what we saw earlier uh, here in, you know, uh, Alexandria uh, and then the, the Greeks, etc. But actually, it is comes from tracking animals. So, so that is a science itself that we don't even know that that's a science. Um, and in fact, tracking animals requires a tremendous amount of knowledge that 
you know, you can actually say is equivalent to a PhD. So some of these Kalahari Bushmen, they can track a single animal in a herd of 50, and they can tell you the gender of the animal. They can tell you whether it's preg pregnant or not, uh, whether it's been injured, etc. So they, they look at the ground and they read it like we read books. So again, you know, you have the same thing. You observe, you have hypotheses, and then you test by looking at what at the ground that you can read like uh, we read books and you can then learn from the evidence and reject or, or accept your hypotheses. And the animal, however, then becomes actually your teacher, which is kind of for us in the Western uh, urban tradition, we perceive that a little bit as, as weird, right? That animals actually teach us something. Um, so, so with this attitude comes also a different perspective, uh, perspective on and a different worldview. And I sort of uh, really um, kind of in a reductionist way, reduce that to two things. It's the circle versus the triangle, right? So the Handa uh often live in a much, much more circular model of reality than we in urban societies do. So the, the circle, in the circle, everybody is important, everybody contributes, everybody is important to the survival of the, of the hunter-gatherer society. And if you live at the margin of survival, you cannot afford to split that tribe right? by, by arguments. You have to figure out consensus. In our urban societies, as we've evolved, um, we put a king uh, at the top, and the king sort of the power flows from uh, flows down from that and uh, people below have to be obedient to that power from the top so that's kind of the triangle and the question i put that in the middle there who, who are the civilized ones right so you know we have uh, a lot of assumptions always that we in urban societies are so civilized and higher developed but is that really truly the case? You know, so I would you know, sort of uh, encourage you to think about that a little bit. Now, now let's go to another aspect in that sort of um, has comes from our urban educational system, and that it comes from work from Howard Gardner, who is a professor at Harvard. Actually, he's in the educational psychology, and he developed this model of multiple intelligences, and he's identified eight that he's, he's very sure about. And you are all familiar with linguistic and logical mathematical uh, intelligence because that's what our K through 12 and college education model actually fosters actively. If you think about the other ones, spatial, musical, bodily, kinesthetic, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and naturalistic, that sort of is underdeveloped to say the least, I would postulate. If anybody disagrees with me, please let me know. Our education system is heavily on linguistic and logical mathematical intelligence geared towards that and, and much less so on these other parts of the, the human brain that it has capacity for. So here's a little example, a little test. So what are the, the leaves here on the right side? Anybody has any suggestion? You mean the plant? Yeah, what's the plant here? I don't know. Anybody yeah, else? I don't know either. No, it's a tough question. The bottom one, isn't it the uh, uh, Quercus? And the oh, yes. top right, I mean, I, I'm trying to think the name in English because I know the name in Spanish is um, un castaño, but um, like chestnut <laughs> or something like that. So, so you were right with the first one. So the first one is, a, is an oak. So an oak leaf. Not very good um, pattern recognition there, Carmen. The other one's actually an ash. And ashes actually have this characteristic thing that, that the leaves go off symmetrically, right? So most trees actually is, are asymmetric, but uh, as they are one of the minority of, of trees where the leaves go off at symmetric places, right? And we could talk about that for much longer, but I'm just trying to Sort of gauge in the audience, you know, how much pattern recognition do we actually learn? Not much. It's not part of our survival toolkit or survival knowledge that we learn. So here's another, and you probably all know those logos. And there's a couple one with with animals that I blanked out the name. So you can all see 
this one, right? Do you, anybody know this here, the, the logo there? Yes, it uh, is Lacoste, it. right? Lacoste. Okay, yeah. And how about this one down here? Uh, Puma. Puma, yes. Okay, all right, all right. So you're very good. So, so we all have that capacity to do pattern recognition, right? Now, how about, uh, uh, which one is the Puma track since you mentioned Puma? I think we don't have to uh, know the Puma track. So we are, not, we are not in the environment. So this is the trick, I, I guess, right? Yeah, but, um, you know, sort of, this is basic uh, hunter-gatherer knowledge 101. For sure. Anybody? I guess it might be something like the G, maybe? No, maybe G is jumping too much. Uh, F? Well, here's a little trick, and I'll tell you that. Um, and we don't, we can spend this, we can spend hours on this. I just, uh, you know, I just wanted to hear uh, whether anybody was, was going to be quick with the answer, but apparently not. So, so one of the things is, of course, a cat, like a puma, uses the claws to, to kill its prey, right? So, so, and they like to keep them sharp, so they withdraw them when they walk. And so wherever you see these dots here, those are actually toe, uh, na uh, toenail marks, right? And the, the cats in D and in U, that you don't see any toenail uh, markings unless with a dog family print or any of the other animals, there's opossums here, there's uh, wolves, coyotes, and so on. They, they all have little marks for the toenails in the front, right? So the ones that don't have that, those are cat family. And so we have two to choose from, uh, U and D. Uh, what about and, Y? What is the uh, letter Y? Um, that, that could also be part of, uh, of the cat family. You, see, you don't see claws. That's right, but uh, it's, it's not a puma uh, because the shape of the pad, heel pad, is actually looks differently. So, um, so obviously, we don't learn this stuff. This is in a hunter-gatherer society, uh, five-year-olds learn this. So another pattern, uh, what's the Earth's CO2 level? So this is now we're going big picture and this is a vital sign of the planet. Anybody? It was, it, I think it's pretty low. It's like, but I know in percentage it's like 0 0.3 or something like that. It's pretty low, right? In part per million, I don't know. So 0.3%, so that would be 300 parts per million. So this is, after all, this is a vital sign of our planet. How come we don't know this? And I, you know, don't feel bad because I ask my students, they don't know. I ask my professor colleagues, they don't know. And I have asked three deans here, they don't know. So this is not common knowledge, except for maybe earth scientists who do this every day. Now, there's something called climate change and global warming happening, and we should all know that number. So here is the data, 412 parts per million. And what's important is to know the historic context, 10,070, and now we're up here at, at 412. That's scary, isn't it? This is the record on the right, over 800,000 years from ice cores, somewhere between 160 to 280, maybe 300. And we're way up here. So if you, if you listen to the news at night, you hear the stock market, but you don't hear the CO2 value. So there's a certain selection of information that, that we receive that fosters particular uh, ways of thinking and particular areas of our brain. But the understanding of nature is not part of it in our very urban-centered uh, societies. So what I just sort of hope to demonstrate, and I... When I started out my journey here 30 years ago, I was there too, and I'm still to some extent, to many extents actually, uh, we are ecologically illiterate. So that means that naturalistic intelligence that we all are capable of, because you saw you all could recognize patterns is missing in being educated and being fostered. So that means we go out outside of the house and we don't see what other people think is normal to see, meaning other people, I mean, in this case, the hunter-gatherer. Um, and so, so fundamental ecological information passes our sight and senses, and we don't register it because we, we are never taught how to 
learn it and, and to interpret that. So, so on top of it, our language also is, is limiting us. So Eskimos have 30 plus different words for snow because that's survival essential for them, right? Now, do we all have to have that? It depends on where you live. You know, the Zulus have 36 terms for green. It depends on sunlight or darkness, uh, whether it's wet or dry, all kinds of different things shape that word green. We have one word green and then, you know, everything almost looks like a green wall when you walk outside, you don't differentiate. And so that's sort of on the physical level and then on a mental level, how we construct things, as I said earlier, the circle is much more part of a hunter-gatherer uh, society that lives close to the land than it is in urban societies. So, so there's already some kind of philosophical and spiritual teaching in the language embedded and in the culture that, that then fosters that in, in, you know, from the time you grow up as a child. Right? So in summary, then our modern science actually is a double-edged sword and we don't even know what we don't know in terms of the knowledge that we don't, first of all, appreciate that's out there, but we are never taught because our yeah, entire um, educational system is, is urban in its nature. And with that comes a particular worldview and then also a selection of knowledge that is passed on, but by teachers who, who have learned that but then um, we are not aware that there are other types of knowledge. Michael, um, yeah. may I interrupt one second? So speaking sure. of language, do you think that as English is one of the most common and most used language for modern mm -hmm. science or Western science? So do you think that that also affects the, the fact that sometimes science is more flat or doesn't have more, I don't know, of perspectives? Yeah, I mean, I mean definitely. Um, and you know the problem is I am I'm European. I, I was I grew up in Germany. I speak English and I um, I speak some French and some Spanish. But for example, I don't know Swahili or uh, Lakota or Chinese or Japanese. For them, I, I know a few words Japanese, but you know I am 100% sure. And you you know maybe uh, you know you should talk or maybe you should invite a, a linguist definitely language forms how we think. I mean, being German, the fact that in, in English, you write the, you capitalize the I, so that that's totally averse to what we do in Germany. You don't capitalize yourself. You, know, you don't put yourself out first. You know? So, but that's just one little tiny linguistic sort of uh, quirk, you know, of the English. Yeah, language. or like there's, there's the, the gender that. thing that we have genders, like in Italian, we have genders and some in English, you don't for some objects, like we, mm -hmm. we have genders yeah, for objects yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, and in English, yeah. you don't. So you imagine an object having a gender while in English, you don't. So that's, that's crazy. Too. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I mean, and so that you, you then project out a quality to onto something and you relate to it differently, right? So, so how we think influences what we see and then vice versa, so it's sort of a feedback. What I'm trying to get at also is that in our scientific sort of communities and world, we think we know everything, that we can go to the library and look up everything, but it's actually not true. There's a lot of local ecological knowledge uh, hidden in indigenous languages and cultures. And some, unfortunately, a lot of languages are dying out. And with that goes the knowledge. So, and, and we are sort of limited um, often by our own frameworks of the language that we, that we learn and grow up with. So, you know, that's what I wanted to stop at a little bit. And in fact, get you to reflect is how does your perception or has it, how has it been shaped and your upbringing, your education and, and your culture? And, and therefore, what do you know? And what do you think you don't know? 
And what do you think you know, but that may actually not be the case. And so um, as Michael, you... I'm interrupting you again, because there is a question related to language in the chat. I don't know if you can read yeah. it. Uh, no, I can't read the chat. Okay, I will read it for you then. Yeah, um, sure. So relating, relating into English language, do you think that approaching the nature of beings with the use of it instead of he, she creates the idea of living beings as objects, inanimate things instead of equal as humans in value? Yeah, I, I, that's part of thing, part of the construction of that reality, right? To go back to that circle of life teaching that, um, I mean, I learned it from a Lakota friend and teacher of mine, actually two of them. And so for them, the human family is a circle within another bigger circle where every animal plant family is a circle within that bigger circle of life. So, so suddenly you have a very different way of, of constructing not only your reality, but also how you value things within your world. So if in a circle, everybody contributes, then you relate to animals differently. Uh, they can be your teacher, uh, and it's a it's a two way street. You reciprocate. They give you, you know, if you're a hunter gatherer, you hunt them. That, um, but then you have to actually give something back. We don't even have that reciprocity principle, right? And Thanksgiving for us is entirely compartmentalized to a Thursday uh, late in November. Uh, it's not an everyday thing. So there's lots of cultural things uh, embedded in in uh, different, uh, uh, you know, in hunter-gatherer societies and, and I would say agricultural societies also that we don't find so much in urban societies where everything becomes much more abstract and, and therefore we don't even know what we don't know in, in the urban societies, right? But we think we know everything. Does that all make sense to you all so far? Yes, yes it does. So, and you know, all of, to all of you, please feel free to hit me up on, on any of these topics. I'll be happy to share things. We are just sort of scraping the, the top of the iceberg here. I have like yeah. a short comment. It's interesting because yeah. when you showed the leaves, I remember like I learned this in school. We in, in elementary school, we went to the forest, we looked at all the leaves, we went to this, these things and also like the, the traces of the animals and everything, but you just don't use it anymore and then you forget and it's so difficult to keep like to remember everything you you ever learn it's yeah I, I know that i knew but i don't know anymore so yeah because it's not a part of your day-to-day -day operating knowledge too, yes right exactly um, but also you don't get to practice right so so you know somebody may have shown you the track on you know in a book or something like that but then you go don't go out and actually lie on the ground and look at your dog's track what did the dog actually you know when you when it made a track in the sand what did that look like you know i've spent hours doing that and it's you know it's a science to looking at at you know just any animal track and in fact uh, study that you can s tell a lot from that and you know in our western worldview we don't even know that that's you know, that's that that's the type of knowledge. I have a question because I think it's very interesting what you're mentioning, but I think it's also obvious to all of us that we cannot know all the things. So we make a selection of the things that might be more useful for the urban society that we have. But I, yeah. I agree that it's like very um, um, misfortunate that we are not having more knowledge about our environment and how we participate in it as animals. So mm -hmm. my question for you would be more, how would you create a better educative program that includes both to have like another perspective on how the world is. So what would you include and what would you leave out, right? Because there's always this debate, uh, at least in, in Spain with the education system is the debate of what we include, what we don't include. For instance, some time ago, they were trying to remove philosophy from the curriculum because they thought that having new technologies would be more important and interesting for the current society, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't agree on that point of view. Because for me, philosophy is like teaching you to learn. But my question is, what do, do we take and what do we leave out? So, so Howard Gardner has actually done a lot of work since he came out with this book uh, originally in the, I think in the 80s. Um, and people have taken this concept of the multiple intelligences to, to 
you know, a, a, a quite a deep level to try to have an educational system where all of these are fostered to at least a basic degree. And then, you know, of course, there are some people are good at music and other people are good at sports. And then, you know, we all have the different capabilities, but at least get a basic floor of, of certain knowledge into, into everybody. And then after that, it's, you know, it's up, up to you, right? And, and so that's the question is, what is that core set of knowledge that we need? And, you know, I'm later going to get to, to sort of the, the next step is going to be the cancer question. And after that, the general environmental situation, where I think we do need that naturalistic understanding in order to understand what's actually happening and then also act uh, accordingly and act wisely to make a difference. Does that make sense? I mean, this is, I have not, I don't have something, you know, completely baked and ready to, you know, propagate on, on large scale. I am discovering this as I go. If you had talked to me 30 years ago, I would have had no clue about any of the stuff that I just presented to you. I agree that we need like more of movement education, like teaching on a movement mm -hmm. and spiritual things. Because I, I remember I, I, I listened to a, a TED talk once a long time ago, and it was another, it was a teacher or um, a high school teacher speaking about exactly this exact problem that we we live in our mind since we start school mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we don't practice all other sort of like movements dancing um theater and they're considered actually as a second hand or second um yeah. grade things so yeah. uh he was speaking about the importance of of also exercise the, the body mm -hmm. and together mm -hmm. with the mind not, not only living in the mind especially when we're still in school in the primary yeah. degree so yeah. i i totally agree with that and i feel that that should be one of the things that should be added but then what to leave out i have no idea <laughs> Yeah, I was mentioning this also. I mean, I was familiar with Gardner's job because my, my, my sister is an educator mm -hmm. and um, she was mentioning about how we consider a person of high capacity, I guess. I don't know how this is the literal translation in, in English, but it's like to be considered a person of high capacity, intellectual capaci capacity, you should con ha consider all these things, not only some of them. So that's something that is also used nowadays for special education of kids with uh, talented, so they have like different classes. I know if you're very good at only one of the characteristics, they are called like um, virtuos. But if you are only, only if you're good at all of them, you could be considered a person of a certain level of, the, 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 let's say that they need a certain level of, of uh, perspective when they are educating them and everything. So I think that the, his ideas are arriving to education world, but I think it's taking longer and it's not available for all the kids at this in most of the countries. But I think it's, it, I would like to see this. I think it would be more similar to what it used to be like school somehow, right? Like once more um, global vision of it, I guess. Yeah, so so Gardner's uh, work is still in, in development. There's lots of other efforts to foster these other parts of the, the human mind and body together and get all the five senses, uh, you know, educated over time. So fascinating discussion. I'd be happy to talk more one-on-one -on -one or um, if we can continue this, uh, uh, you know, maybe another session or so, but uh, uh, let's move on if you don't mind to cancer. So, Again, as I said, you know, uh, when I started my scientific career uh, 30 years ago, this was not uh, for me on the radar screen at all. You know, science, you know, you, you do a, a PCR reaction, it's either positive or negative, right? So what, what does society have to do with that, right? And so, so it turns out if you look at cancer mortality rates around the world, Actually, on the top or right here, you have the incidence rates. In the darker blue, some uh, countries uh, is, is uh, colored in, the higher the incidence rate. And, and then at the bottom, you have the mortality rate, which is, of course, influenced by the medical care um, provision um, and available surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, what's paradoxical is that the Developed countries have actually higher cancer incidence. Development goes together with an increased risk of developing cancer, which is paradoxical. You would think that a quote unquote developed society uh, would, would have less cancer. And so, so that's the first sort of paradoxon in, in cancer uh, that at least struck me because it's contrary to what you would expect. You would expect that a, a well-developed society actually figures out how to reduce its cancer rates. So in fact, these, these differences can be quite large. On the right, you see the relative risk in cancer. Well, that's in Australia, you, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, people of Anglo uh, heritage uh, with little melanin in the skin get more cancer. That's understandable. Understandable, but uh, let's look at uh, prostate cancer in in U.S. versus China. A seventy-fold difference uh, between between Black Americans and Chinese, but it's also breast cancer and colon cancer that's much rarer in China and in Japan than it than it is in the U.S. and Europe, and vice versa. Stomach cancer and liver cancer are much more common over there. So, in fact, when people from Japan move to uh, the uh, U.S., um, in this case, to Hawaii, um, you can see that in Japan, they have a, a low uh, prostate, colon cancer, and breast cancer incidence. And then uh, as they move to Hawaii, their cancer incidence becomes uh, close to be the same level as, as the Hawaiian white population, the Caucasian population, right? So this argument argues very strongly against sort of genetic factors. And in fact, it's environmental factors that play a role in the cancer incidence in the first place. Now, keep that in mind. The next thing that when you read about cancer in most, if not almost all, Western publications, in particular United States, cancer is sort of depicted as this malicious enemy that we have to go all out to kill. And so the, the entire language is permeated with war metaphors. And there are papers demonstrating that. And so that again, you know, going back to what I was mentioning earlier, language frames the way you think and it frames the way you then act. And so this is, if you, now that I've pointed this out, you will start noticing that the choice of words and language that's being used to describe cancer, but also relates to, to other things, because it's not just only cancer where sort of war metaphors have been used for quite a long time in particularly in the United States where Richard Nixon started the so-called war on cancer but you know that it wasn't the only war that Nixon actually was was uh, starting or participating in the war on drugs there was of course the cold war happening in the 70s and and etc but Sort of the idea of doing war on something is is a very common, well, let's say metaphorical tool or linguistic tool. But then the question is, does it actually translate into way more? Right. So we have war on cancer, war on drugs. We have war on terrorism, war on obesity, war on nature with pesticides that we sort of frame as enemies, and we have to then kill chemically or uh, in otherwise. And then of course we have war on minorities, on women, et cetera, also war of words and sometimes more, right? So, so this, is, this is actually very common what linguists call, call that a frame, right? So, so that you have a, a particular context you wanna discuss and you use that frame of war to to then delineate the arguments, right? So, so with that comes a certain mentality, right? So, so it's it's either your friend or or foe, black or white, it's sort of fight or flight. You are either with us or against us. What uh, George W. Bush said after the terrorist attack, and we have the same thing. Of course, the cancer, nobody is with the cancer, so so you know we're going to kill that that enemy of ours, right? And 
with that mindset then comes also a certain rationalization of that aggression, right? In, in, in the fight against evil, every, every tool is, is allowed, right? And we, we also take as in that, you know, all out fight, we, we, we are willing to accept casualties along the way, even if that means in order to save the village, we had to destroy it. And, and then in any war on top of it, we start to, to lose truth along the way, unfortunately. So that, because we have a goal in mind and that, you know, that goal justifies anything and then uh, the truth is not, is a secondary thing. So it becomes a casualty of war also. Now, this wasn't always the case. So in the cancer field, there has been sort of a long debate between sort of three schools. Is cancer caused by viruses? Is cancer caused by chemicals? Or is cancer caused by, by genes? Right? So those were the three major uh, hypotheses that we've been around for about uh, since the beginning of the of the 19th century. And in the 1970s, Samuel Epstein, who you see here on the right, published a book where he summarized the evidence on environmental causes of cancer, including a lot of industrial chemicals. And, um, and so in the 70s, the debate was, you know, how do we in fact limit environmental carcinogen exposure? And that uh, shifted very much so when Ronald Reagan was, was elected president in 1980. And his idea was small government, and, and therefore government had only one thing to do by and large, and that is um, to defend against outside forces uh, through the military. And then social programs and all of that, anything of, of uh, social uplift, that was to be limited, including also regulation of industry, right? So the government's first duty is to protect the people, but not run their lives, sort of is how he framed it. But that means also not run the lives of corporations, let them do what they want to do, right? And that includes also deregulating the Environmental Protection Agency, which is what he did when he became president in the 80s. And then, oh, it's coincidentally, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus at UCSF discovered oncogenes. And then suddenly the entire focus of the entire field shifted to genetic. And it's been there ever since, right? So if you look at a nature science cell, you will find tons about genetics and the molecular biology of cancer, but very little about chemical carcinogens and prevention. By the way, Ronald Reagan was also advertising for the tobacco industry um, before he became president. So one of the industries sort of let loose a bit more. So, so after that, the National Cancer Institute sort of adopted this narrative that cancer is a genetic disease. Right? And here's Andrew von Eschenbach, NCI director. He said that in 2003. Cancer is a genetic disease. And you see that introduction in almost every major talk, you know, paper that you read. Cancer is a genetic disease. That's not accurate. It's a somatic genetic disease where that gets passed on from cell to cell, but for only a very small minority of patients actually within families. It's important to know, of course, but it's not the vast majority of cases, as I showed you from those Japanese migrants earlier. So the same thing under the next NCI cancer director, Harold Varmus, actually, uh, who had discovered oncogenes, became NCI director. And he also you know, focused heavily on genetics. He did have some environmental triggers, as you can see in this text here, tobacco, UV radiation and viruses, but nothing about industrial carcinogens. So again, how you frame it that determines what how what you see and then what you what you then take action on. So right now the debate is, you know, we've spent billions of dollars on cancer. The incidence rates are going down, but the question is, is that actually mostly because of reduced smoking, which was driven not by government initially, but in fact started out in California with a grassroots uh, campaign. And this, what we see here on the left there, the cancer incidence in the United States, that's only within the US uh, that you, you need to really go to the International Agency for Research on Cancer 
and look at what's called cancer today. And the, they just came out with a new world report on cancer and put it into international perspective. And then you see actually the United States is still high in, in incidence. And then next thing is, of course, this whole cancer problem costs us a ton of money. Yeah, very expensive to treat, very expensive, besides, of course, the premature loss of life. So do we have to maybe rethink this whole approach? And so, however, if we want to prevent cancer in the first place, not wait until it, you know, the patient got cancer, we have to do a lot more research. Since the beginning of, of, of uh, the cancer in National Cancer Institute, the, the effort to look at uh, causes and prevention was never more than 10%. In fact, it was in 1972, it was 8%. And then what you see here, this is 2018, the latest I could find from the National Cancer Institute, it's 5.7%. The rest of it is spent on early detection and treatment. This is from 2014, 6%, right? So, so what, what's my argument here? So this is a, a famous uh, set of papers from uh, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg where they summarize the characteristics of cancer. I don't want to go into total detail of it. Some of what, what cancers have in common is they are genetically instable, right? So, um, and that comes after, you know, often if it's an exogenously caused cancer after lots of exposure to carcinogen, whether it's tobacco smoke or asbestos or um, cadmium, uh, you name it. There's lots of uh, carcinogens out there. And a prevention strategy would reduce exposure to those things and, and also provide sufficient nutrition to detoxify. And then at the same time, on the other hand, reduce uh, tumor uh, promoting inflammation as well as support the immune system. None of which are pursued by our mainstream strategies of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and now it's immunotherapy. None of these are stopping chronic inflammation as one of the main drivers of cancer. And we know a lot of these carcinogens, actually. So the IARC has a long list, as you can see here. Um, and, and yet, how much action do we actually take to prevent exposure? Very limited. Long discussion we could have over that. The um, advisory panel to the, can to the president put together a report to, in fact, say how that could be done. Now, this was under President Obama. And then for the last four years, things have been very quiet on that front, uh, to say the least. So we have a particular mindset looking at cancer as an enemy, and then we kill it. And in that quest for killing everything goes. So but you can see the results are not very good. Developing countries have more cancer than actually, a quote unquote. So the developed countries have more than the quote unquote developing countries, right? So we are doing the same thing over and over again, but we're not, not really getting any better. And so we have to really question what is the community of scientists actually thinking and, and doing? And so there's, there's this term that I, I learned along the way, this long way, is, is groupthink, right? So you have a particular mentality within a field, and nobody dares to, to think outside of that framework or outside of that box or whatever you want to call that set of beliefs and, and concepts. And then within that box, you are allowed to freely explore, but don't go beyond that box for whatever reason, because we have all these other factors that influence what actually happens in the field of cancer, you know, from, from detection to treatment and so on. So I hope this was kind of enough, kind of a food for thought for you to maybe think about your own field of science and how much groupthink and dogma do you have in there? And how do you, change that. And in fact, when I was writing this, it occurred to me that change and challenge, very close. First, we have to challenge if we want to then change it. So anybody has any observations in your journey so far on, on your own field, you know, if you now scan back over the years that you've been in there, do you see any groupthink 
things that are assumed to be correct, but may actually be wrong. I feel sometimes it's also related to fashions in, in science and where did the funding come and what, what the funding agency mm -hmm. fund mm -hmm. actually. And I think that can impact the dogmas and the group things. Mm -hmm. um, that's at least that's what I noticed in, in my field. There is a lot of very cool things that I would like to study and but sometimes you have also to balance it mm -hmm. um, with the fundings that you can get because they don't fund those things. But I agree with you that that is totally like increasing the dogma. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with, Car with Carmen about, about this thing. I think that, I mean, there are these trends, right? So you can be in a hot topic in the field at that time. I remember, for instance, some years ago, there was this thing about um, autophagy in molecular biology field. Everyone was doing autophagy. Everyone was looking at autophagy. And autophagy is super important and super cool and something that is worth to study. And I don't want to diminish it. But there was a lot of crappy science being at the topic that was very easily published because it was just at the topic of the moment. And it happens the same thing, for instance, with the microbiome and, and all these things. So I, I have friends working in microbiomes and they tell me this. I mean, I can publish practically wherever I want because it's so uh, a, a trendy topic that everyone wants to publish this stuff right now. Mm -hmm. and, and this is how that starts. But but I think that we are, the problem is not that much that we are having these trends in science. I think the problem is more that many people are not aware of them and are not critical with them. And I think that as you were saying, all this, all this thinking that is shared by all the community and by everyone and, and, and not being questioned is where it's the, the, the potential danger to do better science. And I remember also the example that we first saw with the microRNA or the epigenetics. This is still very important, but I don't know, some years ago, it looked like it was going to, to, to be involved in every single thing you were doing. And later, the biology is always complex. Everything is involved in everything, that thing and many others. So everything is very complex. I, I, I think that challenging the views at the moment, it's very, very difficult. And Carmen and I, we work with both with astrocytes and we work in a field where neurons are like the important cells and you always have what is going on with the, with the neurons and how it is going on with the neurons and what is like the final point and why do we believe that way? It's only because it was easy to measure, easy to stain at the moment and easy to look at. That's mm, when we started yeah. to look at neurons. But actually no one had any proof to believe that they were like the most important cells in the brain, but it was mm. only easy to look at and now you cannot change that field because it's called neuroscience and if you cannot challenge that vision it's very difficult to convince editors many times that you have something if you are not relating it to neurons finally but people working in neurons can very easily publish on things that are related without even looking at astrocytes or glia in general mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I, I think that that's an example of how we have built this idea that this is what matters in the brain and and i think it's if i understood this i think it's related to this, right? So you have, again, sort of a hierarchy, right, of uh, what's more important, the neuron is most important, and then comes the astrocyte, and then... Uh, yeah, so only go the astrocytes, who cares about them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can tell you, I'm, I'm not a card-carrying immunologist, but the immunologists have the same thing, you know, the T-cell is sort of the king, and then, then comes the B-cell, and if you're a macrophage researcher, I mean, you're just a low life. I'm sorry, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit facetious here, of course. You know, nothing wrong. Macrophages are fascinating. But, but among some people, you know, this kind of rank order thinking is so dominant. And it influences how we perceive reality and then how we construct it as a society. Yeah, and it's also it's also like modifying which are our questions because we know what we need to do to be published and to have like mm -hmm. to achieve all the goals that we consider of a successful career and not following really the question that that is give is trying to fill in a gap in knowledge necessarily and I think that that is mm -hmm. a very big problem of science right now in general. This is my perception and of course my research is something I would like to find. And I always remember this example that gave me a, a so in, in, in Valencia, where I was studying, they were like, they had this program in which every year they were inviting like uh, Nobel awardees to talk with the students and everything. And one of them told me that 
uh, it was the, 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 he participated in the discovery of the proteasome, right? So he told me that he was fascinated on how proteins got degraded because it was energetic dependent. So that told him that it was somehow regulated. The people were all fascinated by how they were produced. So how are proteins synthesized and how they were degraded. And he said, mm -hmm. look, what I did is show something and was super exciting for me and pursue that and try to do that science. And no one cared about how proteins were degraded at that point. No one cared at all. But for me, it was interesting. And I followed that because I thought it was an important scientific question. And now I have the Nobel Prize and everyone looks at that and say, oh, yeah, he found out that. Yeah, but I was following a question that was important and no one was paying attention to the, that at that mm -hmm. point. So. My advice for you, young researcher, is choose something that you really are excited to work on. And you choose something, it's really a big question in science. That's what he told us. And I think it was a good advice. I still remember it. I totally agree. But at the same time, you know, I haven't arrived at nowhere near the Nobel Prize. I mean, I haven't even published my, my stuff for a long time because I'm trying to crack some tough nuts and tough nuts, well, they're tough to crack. And, and so you don't publish for a long time. And we all know the paradigm publish or perish. And that's how the system operates. So you may go through the desert to use a metaphor for quite a while before you get to water. And that's a tough proposition. And, and you know, I think it's a failure in science that we don't don't support those things much more than sort of the obvious. So we fund, I'm, I'm a bit facetious here, but often we fund, if it was a basketball game, the slam dunks that are halfway in the basket, right? And not something really difficult. And, and that's a difficult thing, you know, as a society, what do we, how do we decide what, what needs money, what, what is su worth supporting? And, you know, very complicated. It, and it's, it influences all It's all sort of enmeshed in this social construction of science, right? Uh, not only what do we know, but how do we practice it? And then what do we support financially? Lots of factors influencing it. It's not just the facts that count. I agree, Michael. And I would like to see more agencies that fund crazy projects. There are a couple of them. Mm -hmm. I think like this, um, this, Templeton Foundation. I know that because my husband got um, a fellowship through them, a grant through them. And mm -hmm. but it's also a um, religious foundation. But it, it doesn't fund religious uh, related mm -hmm. um, uh, topics. But it funds mm -hmm. more uh, frontier science. Let's let's say mm -hmm. that. And and that is very very interesting because I think as a society we should push towards this kind of agencies, and these should really impact. And then of course, like probably. 90% of these projects will not result in anything, but then for that 10% of this project, even if it was 1%, I would fund all of them to see which is the 1% the that yeah. brings uh, the new awesome and, and great discovery. So yeah, let's hope that we can see that and we can push through that in the future. I, I hope so too. It's but it's it's a difficult, you know, you you always have these countervailing forces, right? So risky projects, you know, is it a waste of money? Is it uh, you know, you have to justify everything. Einstein once said, um, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, would we? So we are all sort of at the edge of the unknown. We don't really know what we're doing, but we're trying to figure it out, right? But then if you have a business person uh, looking at your, that as your business plan, that's a catastrophe for a business person, right? And we have too many business people influencing how science is done. Not only have they taken over science to some extent, but also they've taken over medicine, the same thing there. But I don't want really to go there, so... So I have a few more slides. So I'm going to skip through these. So this is going to be sort of a movie and fast forward, right? So the next thing I think, so the cancer field, I gave you uh, my sort of ideas to what something, it's something I, I know quite well, um, but we all live in an age, in fact, that's called the Anthropocene, where we have, in fact, as humanity, as a human family together, we have changed the planet on a geological and geochemical level, 
Uh, and we're facing issues that may in fact endanger our species survival and not just our own species, but as is indicated by the term of the sixth extinction of also the lots of other species in the process. So the Anthropocene, in fact, is a term created by uh, Eugene Stürmer and then popularized by uh, Paul uh, Crutzen, a, a chemistry a Nobel laureate. And it refers to our, the, the really profound changes that humanity has had on the planet. And you know, from deforestation here in the lower left, uh, this is the original cover of, of, of uh, uh, primal forest in the United States. And then today we have less than 2% or so remaining. We are changing the CO2 levels. I showed you that earlier. Sea levels are rising, temperatures are going up. So we have a lot of parameters that are showing actually that they're going, that they're going in the wrong direction. And um, we have to, as a scientific community, we also have to think about how we interact with that. We're losing species. Now I'm going to go a bit faster. We're losing not just birds, but, but other ones. So scientists have gotten together and in fact, warned humanity about these trends. And I would urge you all to, to look at these at this website. And in fact, I'd be happy to share all of my slides if you want to have them. I have also slides uh, uh, that I haven't showed, but uh, with more information. Uh, we keep uh, pumping out pesticides as if there is no tomorrow. We have, all of us have toxic body burdens, including the, our breast milk is contaminated by them. So nothing is really pristine anymore. We have plastic parts from the deepest uh, sea levels all the way up to the top of Mount Everest. And not just plastic parts, but with it come endocrine disruptors that are messing with our hormone levels. And you know, these plastic parts are uh, then uh, you know, ended up in, in the oceans and in landfills and, and create a lot of problems and disease. And then another level here of, of, of contamination comes from, from our uh, fossil fuel industry, in particular now with the fracking um, that is contaminating drinking water in lots of places in the US. And so we are we're really uh, messing with the system of the earth, of the biosphere. Now, the good news here is after all of this negative is we have a lot of solutions and, but they are still sort of in the minority, right? And I'd be happy to share all of these uh, you know, books and reading lists and whatever you want um, to get you engaged on a societal level towards moving towards a, a better society, a, bet, a, a, a society, human society that lives in harmony with, with the biosphere that we actually depend on. So this green chemistry to rethink how we produce things. And so it boils down to really this, this choice, you know, do we want to continue our destructive ways or do we want to actually change to an ecological society that has a different view that is you know, where, where we're interdependent with nature, we also understand nature. That's why I had this first chapter there. If we can read nature, then we understand how we interact with it. And then we can also appreciate it more. We, we, we treat it with more respect and we foster our own well-being by taking care of nature. We are not there yet. We don't have that caretaker attitude. Most of our actions and I'm not saying every one of you, but in some, you know, our in industries, et cetera, are run by people who don't have that mindset. And so how do we change that? And it starts, a lot of it starts in, in academia when we train students, right? Where we uh, teach them how to think and how not to think. So we need to really make a conscious choice to uh, think much more in terms of the big picture, as I say, think uh, globally, act locally, but also know locally everything right? uh, about your local environment and how we are actually impacting it. Then uh, if we all make changes in our local environment, then we will not stand by to the destruction, but we'll actually start making a difference and turning it around because it's also actually our life here uh, is at stake. So. We live really in a key moment in society. 
uh, right now. And as Wangari Matai says here, you know, we are, we have the choice. Do we want to move to a higher level of consciousness or not? And do we, you know, at this critical moment, do we actually turn the corner towards something healthier or do we head off the cliff? And that's the big question. You know, if we continue this war on, on nature and on life on the planet, then we will destroy ourselves. And we can't do that uh, because that will be suicidal. So we have a lot of things to learn on a mental, emotional, spiritual level to relate to each other better, more peaceful, more um, harmoniously, as well as relate to the natural world in a, in a better way so that we actually have a future as humanity together. And so I would encourage all of you to, to go beyond the science that you do and somehow get involved in, in one level or another to turn this, this ship around from the Titanic, from heading towards the iceberg, right? And there's lots of teachings and spiritual traditions and, and wonderful philosophies that already exist, but we have to make those much more mainstream. And that starts in K through 12 education and academia, then to, to have a society that's uh, harmonious with, with the natural world that we all depend on. And we can learn, can learn a lot from indigenous societies, which in, actually in, in this, you know, on this slide here, you see that Black Elk and Albert Einstein are actually not very far away, if not maybe saying the same thing, that when you expand your mind enough, it encompasses everything. Um, then you also act and think for, for everything in everyday, in everyday action, right? not just for a limited narrow self that you want to maximize the profit for, right? So I can urge you only to get engaged, organize, start making a difference. So Martin Luther King asked, you know, what's, what are you doing for others? And I would add, what are you also doing for the biosphere? So with that, it always seems impossible until it's done. These are all the people that I have to thank for. Long list. And I thank you all for, for listening. Thank you, Michael. This was a very inspiring talk. Um, there was an interesting um, comment in the chat saying that as a scientist, we also account for uh, some of the pollution to the environment with our plastics. There was yep. a suggestion in the yep. chat to, to look at the Green Lab website for more information and awareness about that. Absolutely. Um, so part of what we do in science, we're part of that plastic disposable uh, one-way street of resource extraction to consumption to landfill. And we need to close that circle somehow. And in fact, it's interesting. I don't know any of you are physicists, but if you think of it as a phys, if we close that loop, that's a great reduction in entropy in the system. So nature had crises in evolution where that circle wasn't existing. There was an oxygen crisis where nature created too much oxygen and a lot of life died. And then it closed the circle. And that was the, the, the rise of the animals starting to eat the oxygen producers. And then we, we arrived at some kind of balance. And if we can close that loop, then, then we can actually live within the system powered by the sun, endless amounts of energy almost, and we can live within the system sustainably. But we have to close a lot of the loops and the plastics that we use in the lab is definitely one of the problems. I'm as guilty as any anybody else in the scientific enterprise. Yes, and we need to not just point with the fingers at others, but point at us ourselves too, and try to make a difference. No, I scared I think, everybody away here, I guess. No, you didn't, I think but I'm, we're all reflecting about all the information yeah. that we received. I think you didn't scare us. You made us think that it's much more valuable. <laughs> If you want to send me a thank you. email. Thank you, Michael. And I also suggested to email you if anybody wants the slides. I have 105 here right now, even though I, I ended at 70. So 
I had a hard time cutting stuff out. So, but I think I'm glad it, it got sort of done within the time limit. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be happy to okay. continue this, this uh, sort of dialogue because it's something that you, we don't have in our scientific communities too much. In fact, that's something I w wanted to ask to you. If you manage to incorporate this in, as a class for grad students in your institution or something, because I think that would be like something so interesting, right? No? no? Okay, that would be something, I mean, I would suggest that even for our, our graduate programming here. I don't know if we could teach that, but I think it's, it's a very good point. And, you know, um, many of the topics that you were discussing, um, I discussed with them, with my, about them with my PI too. She's, she's German too. I don't know if it's something about the German education. She says that there they make you like having like more discussion and having like way more of this, but she's also like very critical sometimes on how we do science and what is actually our interpretation of the things from what are the facts and how we create science. So I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. about that. I'm curious if it's related to the German system. And I like it because she challenges, she, she challenges me a lot on the way I'm thinking and all the mm -hmm. preconceptions we have. And when we're writing grants, for instance, we start first with a table or the assumptions that we have to check if they're actually true and which is the support we have for the things we believe. And normally mm -hmm. it's very weak. You know, there are a lot of things that we have been written, we read them in all the reviews and all the papers, but later they are very weak. And, and this mm -hmm. reminded me a lot of, of all those things we believe about science. But So, so one, one observation that I've made over the years, or one tip you could almost say, you know, so You know, Einstein is one example, but he's not the only one where you notice some kind of anomaly where some observation goes against the common sort of flow or, of thought or conceptualization. And, and everybody else sort of glosses it over, glosses over it. And I can give you a number of examples. I don't know the off, off of my head, but I can, I can look them up uh, and it's come up repeatedly. And so, but it sticks in your mind and you don't put it down as, as noise. What other people think is noise for you is data and you analyze it further. And in fact, then you come up with something that, that is new to explain that noise, what other people thought is noise can be very, very fruitful, but it's also, as I said earlier, it's that walk through the desert that you have to go through because Everybody else is like the lemmings. Uh, they are, you know, migrating in a completely different direction. You're absolutely right. And, and I, I feel, for instance, one of the things I feel is I'm doing much better science now at this point of my career because of that. So as, as I was telling you, I think my PI is very good at doing that at being very critical with the stuff and not ignoring like all those things that are going on. <laughs> But it's surprising how, how we scientists call mm -hmm. ourselves to be objective when we are not and no one teaches us that we are not we are humans and we have our biases and everything but for instance it happened to us that mm -hmm. we were finding epilepsy in animals that were controlled and we were like super surprising oh what's going on did we mess this up whatever and we were trying to find the literature mm -hmm. and no one was talking about it but later behind the scenes you were talking to other researchers and they also had that But they excluded those data. So people couldn't know that they were actually finding that because that uh -huh. was not what's expected. Yeah, yeah. And if you didn't ask for it, no one was admitting it. And, and you know, I think that that's like, it's like a lack of ethics. It's not lack of ethics in the sense it's not that you're doing on purpose. It's just lack of research training, like like scientific training for you more than the, the intention of doing things wrong. But it happens so often in science that it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the inconvenient truth, you know, uh, people gloss over, uh, ignore, downplay, etc. I mean, it's interesting over time to learn all of these mental mechanisms, how we process information and uh, often also misprocess. And then on the other hand, how we're influenced by others in our own thinking and You know, we, we see that on social media, et cetera. So there's influencers and there's, you know, it's all about the social construction of, of knowledge in, in science as well. And we have thought, quote unquote, thought leaders, you know, and it's always good to have your own independent way of, of, of thinking and analyzing and being critical, even though that may put you 
uh, very much on the outside. So then you have to be able to sort of deal with social isolation. It's not so easy either. We're all social animals, right? So all of these are very complicated dynamics that influence our science work and our careers, et cetera. And, you know, the, the sad thing is in graduate school, and I'm glad you encouraged me to, to put, a, put a course together, we don't talk about those aspects. There's lots of stuff we don't talk about in, in, in graduate education. And it's, it's also difficult um, because um, you get into very complicated matters and you may have different opinions and so on. So, so how do you organize it? I don't know. I'm just, I put this here together for the first time. It was sort of a trial balloon and um, um, who knows what I'm going to do with it um, in the long run. But um, I hope this was all helpful to you and a food for thought and also especially in my last part, food for action. So we need action. Our planet is, at, as I said, 412 parts per million. And the trend is only going up. So I would encourage you all to get involved one way or another. I had a old time environmentalist, David Brower. He asked me that question, you know, uh, can you do something for the environment? And I've been an activist, uh, sort of, I didn't talk about it in this, this talk, but... Um, have been sort of an activist in my spare time. Um, and you all have a fantastic knowledge, so you can get involved. Don't just hide in the ivory tower of science. You have precious knowledge, and so get out there and get engaged. There's lots of people who have no clue and, and are fully engaged. So it's good to have people who, who have a deep understanding out there also. Yeah, that's so true. That as, as a scientist, we should do this more to get engaged with the public. And yeah, it's dangerous territory. It's not easy. I mean, I'm, you know, super yeah. dangerous. Yes, we, can, we can have a whole we can have a whole nother session on that. So um, exactly. I would I would suggest, first of all, let's keep in mind to have other sessions on this topic in the next editions. We could have something more in detail, because I think that's very interesting that so we can discuss about that. And I also mm -hmm. suggest you, like Carmen said, if the university doesn't agree for you to incorporate this in a course, so you can also exploit some of the online platforms like Coursera or other things like that. And you mm -hmm. can see if they are interested and you can record a course for them and then it can be broadcasted yeah. in all around the world. Yeah. So that would be also I mean, I would follow it. So I think a lot of other people will be interested and you can make a, another impact. So, so the, the, the talk here was recorded for YouTube yeah. and that's going to be publicly available, right? Yes, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so, I, was, I was suggesting if you want to do uh, something even more in detail. Um, yeah, I will. I'm working on it. Um, and it's always, you know, always good to get a feedback and also collaborators. Sure, if, of course. You know, yes, um, we are here. <laughs> Carmen and I, we are like, maybe, all the maybe, people we can help. <laughs> maybe we want to have a course like that, you know, we can co-teach it or something. Um, it doesn't yeah. have, have to be just one one person. Uh, Why not? So yeah, that would be awesome. About that. Yeah, um, sure. So I would like to thank you again for this awesome talk. Thank and you. there were a lot of very nice feedback and comments in the chat. This was inspiring. This was great. So really, uh, all the people loved it. And I, I hope all the people on YouTube are going to love it even more. Um, so thanks to all the people that uh, stayed until the very end. And um, thanks to all the bio room people that helped organizing this um, incredible second edition. So thank you thank again. Thank you very much, Michael. It was Happy. great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.